Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Angel, and I'm speaking to you from Philadelphia. I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation, and I want to welcome you to the Black Struggle is Class Struggle, a deeper look into the revolutionary elements of Reconstruction, the Civil War, and more class. Black Struggle is Class Struggle is a four-part digital class series hosted by the PSL intended to uplift um, Black revolutionary history in this country, its central role in the development of society today, and to underscore the idea that revolution is possible within the United States. Having formally welcomed you, we want to extend our hopes that the next four classes will not only deepen your knowledge of the Black struggle for national liberation, but deepen your commitment to struggling for Black liberation. We believe a few fundamental things. Black people in the US are a nation, so you may hear us use phrases like national oppression, where you normally hear racism. And the final class of the series will deal with these theoretical themes more in depth. We also believe that national oppression is essential to capitalism and thus the enemy of self-determination. And in the final analysis is that monopoly capitalist ruling class. And Black liberation is class struggle because Black freedom cannot coexist with capitalism. Over the next four classes, we hope together to explore some of the essential elements of the Black experience in the United States with an eye towards illuminating the central role of the Black struggle at the center of the major turning points in U.S. capitalist history. A fact which means we also believe that any successful struggle against the capitalist class for liberation and socialism will have its core leadership emerge from the national liberation struggle. So welcome, and we're looking forward to learning together. And now I'm gonna kick it to Eugene for some opening remarks. Well, thanks so much, Angel. I really appreciate that. Um, very honored to be here with everyone uh, on the class. Very honored to be working with my co-panelists and everybody else that has made the, this possible behind the scenes, in front of the scenes. Uh, to do it. So welcome everybody and thanks again Angel and everyone else who helped put this class together. Now this first class that we're about to do is Slavocracy and the Civil War as you know and apologize if I look at my notes a little bit here on my side. Now obviously this is a very broad history. We can't touch everything, even everything of importance, but we can certainly touch on a lot. Um, but we're not looking here to be exhaustive, but representative in terms of the, the way we're covering this history. And we really wanna look at the history of slavery, for instance, through the history of slave revolts. There's many other aspects to slavery and there's many things we'll touch on that deserve to be fleshed out in their own right. But we wanted to use that in the context of black history, and Black struggle is class struggle to really look at this critical period of slavery through the lens of those who are resisting through revolting throughout the plantation South. And we also want to look at the role of the Civil War in a similar way, primarily through the lens of the Black soldiers and strikers, those who are on a general strike, and we'll talk about that in the Plantation South, people working as couriers, people working as spies, people working as camp laborers, uh, exhorters, newspaper articles, whatever it may be, the intervention of Black America in the Civil War, which is what made it into a transformative event uh, and a transformative social movement, which is why, uh, you know, I think we really want to talk about this to not just talk about the history, but to link it in to where we are today and what lessons we can learn. So, those are some of the pieces we want to get into as it concerns this class. So we will jump right into our class here tonight. And we want to start with Angel, go back and going back to Angel, who's going to talk with us about slave revolts. Um, all right. Yeah, great. Um, could. Oh, great. Thank you. So um, to understand racism, right? we must also understand slavery and really understanding the fact that racism evolved as this like ideological justification um, of slavery. And for 350 years, it shaped the relations between blacks and whites in the United States. Um, and racism and slavery were the foundation of the development of capitalism in the United States and in Europe. 
And something to think about as we're talking about slave revolts is this, um, this common thread of rebellion and resistance. People were not just taken from their own, um, you know, their own land um, without fighting back, without a spirit of struggle. Um, and there is this rebellion that occurred, that just occurred over history. And this rebellion is the natural result of the exploitation and oppression that people go through. And it has been proved over and over again throughout history, even to this current day. And the history of slave revolts is one that is directly connected to the exploitation of black people and their labor and the forms of collective resistance that come from intense struggle. And the struggle against slavery in the United States is often summed up in the events of the Civil War with white abolitionists taking center stage. However, the history of US slavery is rich in examples of resistance where the enslaved Africans themselves were the protagonists. And when black enslaved people organized themselves as a class against the oppressive forces of their enslavement, their power shook the very core of this genocidal American system. Next slide, please. Um, and from the beginning of chattel slavery, Black people were finding ways to resist this inhuman system of enslavement. Slave rebellions were important to this ongoing abolitionist struggle as they were the first instances of Black people organizing themselves as a, as a class and challenging the system of bondage that oppressed them. And this combination of slavery with the dynamics of capitalism and its quest for profit made the system of slavery in the Americas far more brutal than anything ever seen before in history. And due to that, those material conditions were such that resistance could result in death. And so in kind of between the events of particular slave revolts, enslaved Africans resisted slavery in a very variety of active and passive ways. Um, and a common form of that was day-to-day um, -day resistance. And it was the most common form of resistance to slavery. They would break tools, feign illness, stage slowdowns, and commit ar acts of arson and sabotage. And all of those things were forms of resistance and expression of slaves' autonomy over their own bodies. And violent slave revolts happened, right? And they were rare. Um, but they were also necessary for the morale of the people and showed that they had that revolutionary spirit to organize themselves and to try their best to get out of this unjust system. And without slave revolts, the history of Black emancipation would have looked quite different. Next slide, please. Um, and as you see here in this, um, in this picture, um, people, um, uh, slaves often would, enslaved people rather, would often gather in groups at night and they would talk and discuss so the need, the, what was going on in th during the day on the plantation. And those were often the sites where people would organize themselves and plan to get free. Next slide, please. The first documented slave rebellion was the Gloucester County Conspiracy or Birkenhead's Rebellion in Gloucester, Virginia in 1663. And this rebellion um, was quite interesting as I was researching about it because it was not just made up of black enslaved people. It was made up of black enslaved people, white indentured service and indigenous people. And so from the beginning, you're seeing that there's this collaboration um, uh, and solidarity across different classes in order to um, try to erupt or to cause some change. And this rebellion set the stage for many of the other slave rebellions in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and just because, although I will say, just because this was the first documented slave rebellion does not mean that there were not others that um, historically happened. I'm, I am I have full faith that, you know, people found ways to rebel in many, in, in stories that we might not know or might not ever know. Um, please, uh, next slide, please. Um, one, of the, one of the largest slave revolts happened in New York State, actually. Um, in the early 18th century, New York City had one of the largest slave populations of any of England's colonies. And slavery in New York City differed from other colonies because there weren't large plantations. 
Um, and the slaves worked in many different positions. They were domestic servants, artisans, dock workers, and various other skilled laborers. And enslaved Africans lived near each other, which made communication very easy. And they also often worked among free black people, and which was a situation that did not exist as, um, as frequently um, in plantations in the South. And slaves in the city could communicate and plan an uprising more easily than among those on plantations. Um, and these conditions that led to the great slave revolt um, in 1712 was, um, were several things. One major factor was the creation of the Wall Street slave market, which led to a massive increase of enslaved people and that population surged um, to almost 20% of the population of that colony being enslaved people. And colonial restrictions that were put um, on uh, black people as this was um, as this was occurring um, included requiring passes for traveling, lack of marriage rights, and not being allowed to gather in groups of more than three persons. And all of those um, restrictions led to the New York Slave Revolt of 1712. Next slide, please. And you can see here, this is the New York slave market. Um, this is a, a carving that was created around 1730. That New York slave market is where Wall Street currently stands. And that symbolism, um, you know, you could, there's a lot to say about that symbolism that um, where, you know, the belly of, you know, United States capitalism resides was also a slave, uh, slave market where black people were sold um, like they were cattle, right? Um, next slide, please. So um, a group of more than 20 black slaves had gathered on the night of April 6th, 1712, and they set fire to a building. And while the white colonists tried to put out the fire, the enslaved people armed with guns, hatchets, and swords attacked the whites and then ran off. Um, however, almost immediately, all of those runaway um, slaves were re reunited with their owners and colonial forces arrested 70 blacks and jailed them. Six were reported to have committed suicide, 27 were put on trial, 21 of whom were convicted and sentenced to death, including one woman with child. Um, and after the revolt, excuse me, the city and colony passed more restrictive laws, even more restrictive laws um, governing black um, and uh, indigenous um, or Indian slaves. And slaves were not permitted to gather in groups more than three. They were not permitted to carry firearms and gambling was outlawed. And small crimes um, range, crimes small, ranging from small crimes of property damage to larger crimes of rape and conspiracy to kill qualified for the death penalty immediately. Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, that uh, seems to be the double slides. Um, okay, so this um, painting was um, actually, uh, uh, it was painted in the mid to late 1800s. Um, and this painting is, clearly shows this bias towards um, the white colonists and kind of paint, depicts the black enslaved people as savages, as people who are you know, inherently violent um, and not as people who were, um, you know, dehumanized, who were fighting against their oppressors and who wanted um, their own freedom. Next slide, please. So um, with slave up uprisings, they were more common than you might think. Um, despite the fact that they were rare, they did pop up occasionally to, um, depending on the region and depending on the conditions in the particular colonies and also in particular states after the, um, after the creation of the United States. Um, slaves in South Carolina staged several insurrections in the 1700s, but the, one of the largest slave uprisings or revolts happened at the Stono Rebellion in 1739 when they seized arms killed whites and burned houses. And the Stono Rebellion occurred at the Stono River Bridge near Charleston. 
And the conditions which led to the Stoner Rebellion were very multifaceted. The majority of the population of the colony were enslaved persons. So white folks were a minority in that area. Um, and slavery was integral to the economy and South Carolina was an entirely slave society, which um, was different from some certain colonies were um, different and having mixture um, of different economies, but um, South Carolina was a complete slave society um, and the working conditions were brutal. And so um, these enslaved people were hearing about Spanish Florida um, that was offer and it was offering freedom to enslaved people. And so many of them were organizing together and saying, hey, well, we should look into you know, leaving here and going to Spanish Florida to um, acquire their freedom. And a major goal um, for almost many, almost all enslaved people was to head to the free territories. And many enslaved people wanted to join this colony in Spanish Florida. It was called Fort Mose, and it was a free colony of black people. And Florida was 150 miles from Stono, South Carolina. Um, and an interesting aspect to um, this rebellion as well is that there's a religious um, kind of backbone to this as well. Many of the enslaved people in Stono had converted to Catholicism and many had believed that they would thrive, be able to thrive in Spanish Florida um, and due to their faith and due to the fact that Spanish Florida was colonized by um, a primarily Catholic um, group of people. Next slide, please. So on uh, September 9th, 1739, enslaved people organized themselves and led by a literate enslaved person, Jemmy, he led 60 um, Congolese, um, primarily almost all of the slaves in that region of South Carolina were from um, the Congo. Um, they chose to revolt on a Sunday because they knew that the slaveholders would be at the church services. And they marched through Stono with religious symbols, crosses, and weapons, and they shouted liberty in their native, native language, Lukango. And they killed 20 whites, um, but afterwards, many of them were executed or sold. However, this was one of the largest slave revolts in US history and had direct inspiration for um, future slave revolts and future abolitionist organizing. Next slide, please. So the last um, rebellion that I'm going to talk about is Nat Turner's Rebellion. Um, and Nat Turner's Rebellion in Virginia, South Hampton County ranks about among one of the best known slave uprisings in the United States. Um, and Nat Turner is a really interesting person. Um, he conducted religious services and he had learned how to read and had studied the Bible. And his rationale for rebellion um, featured a lot of strong religious language. And Turner told many slaves of his, his visions and other divine signs signaling them to rise up. And Turner used the religious language to agitate other enslaved people, finding liberatory messages within the text that others responded positively to. And these biblical overtones were only the exterior form of what was essentially a class struggle. Um, and something to note is that when it occurred in 1831, Southampton was in an economic decline and the slave population um, was having these um, issues of, you know, this uh, intense uh, working conditions and there's a growth of anti-slavery feelings. Um, and this also had to do with these precautionary repressive measures that were being devised by the owning class on, on, on top of everything that was already going on. And so the enslaved people were already like, you know, the, struggling um, to make things work. Um, and so the, that all sets the scene for this rebellion. Next slide, please. So on the evening of August 21st, 1831, Turner and another five slaves set out to win their freedom. And Turner's um, slave holder, Joseph Travis, along with his family, were the first to lose their lives with, to the rebellion. And with arms and horses, the slaves marched forth and they recruited others along the way. And within the first 24 hours, Turner's group of six slaves swelled to 70. 
And by the morning of August 23rd, they had already taken the lives of at least 57 white slave owners and their supporters. But on that day, unfortunately, Turner and his followers suffered a severe defeat at the hands of a white militia with superior arms. And three companies of artillery aided by hundreds of other soldiers and militia dealt the final blow the following day and they quelled the rebellion through indiscriminate murder. Um, but this isn't just about Nat Turner as a person because although there are indications that Turner was a persuasive man, he was a preacher, he knew how to talk, but that would be a serious mistake to credit the appeal of the uprising merely to his oratory skills. Because um, really it was about the whole group of these enslaved people being aware of their conditions as a class and working together. Nat Turner was agitating, but they were working together as a group. Um, and there is this quote that said that it caused an eruption through the breath of the slave south, which always rested on a volcano of outraged humanity. And the wave of uprisings inspired by the Nat Turner rebellion reflected that the oppression of slavery had reached a breaking point making slave society ripe for rebellion and kind of connecting to the ongoing abolitionist cause and all of those things that led to the, the civil war. Next slide. Oh, where did it go? Oh, um, lastly, there is um, this, um, this is a really interesting, um, drawing of Nat Turner um, and a white slaveholder. And it's it's just very interesting for me to think about um, what he must have been thinking in this in, in this moment. Um, you know, so I thought that was an interesting thing to include. Next slide, please. So these um, lastly, um, I want to make this connection very like clear that these slave revolts, I think, have a direct correlation to shaping the abolitionist movement, creating its revolutionary character, but they also strongly relate to the waves of rebellions that we've seen against police violence, against this white supremacist capitalist like um, system that we are under. And the rebellions that we saw last summer have the same revolutionary spirit of the slave revolts 200 years ago. And these slave revolts really paved the way for black struggle in the United States because they showed that people could organize themselves for a cause. They show that people can harness that revolutionary spirit towards making a radical social change. And so these slave revolts have a direct correlation to all of the rebellions that we saw against the horrible system that we're under. And so, Black history and Black struggle is directly formed and forged by these slave revolts. Um, so that is my um, portion of the class and I will kick it off to Eugene. Well, thank you so much, Angel. Um, that was great. <laughs> A lot that can be said there, you know, you guys to go after somebody when you're thinking all these thoughts, that Wall Street piece really sitting with me, but thank you again. Um, for offering that. You know, we wanted to talk briefly here, you can see Republican politics in the Civil War really kind of laying the framework, right? Because as Angel laid out very well in her presentation, you know, Black people revolting in profound ways was nothing new to the United States. Um, looking for allies wherever they could and to create a greater social confrogation, whether it's allying with the allies, I mean, the opponents rather, of their slave owners and the people who ran their colonies, the indigenous indentured servants. But this time, obviously, it succeeded, right? The Civil War worked. So what was this coalition, this Republican Party that came together, it only really came together just before the war, um, that became the vessel by which this profound change of ending slavery could take place? So next slide, if you don't mind. Um, so this photo is a famous photo. Um, it's called Uncle Sam's First Thanksgiving. It's from Thomas Nast, who was a famous pro-Union cartoonist during the war, during the Civil War. It's actually from 1869, but um, after the war, but I'll explain in a second why I brought it up. Um, but one thing I just want to mention parenthetically, you know, Nast as an artist was so huge uh, in the impact of shaping consciousness about the war 
that Lincoln said that he was our best recruiting sergeant. And irrespective of anything regarding this particular class, I think that's a powerful statement about the impact of art, about the impact of cultural work and being able to move large numbers of people around political ideas. But I, I note this because this NAST made this in 1869 for a range of reasons, but it's supposed to represent uh, the breadth and the depth of the broad Republican coalition of who they were seeking to be. I won't say too much about it. You can look for yourself and see there. The point I wanna make about it is, you know, you can see it's a very broad group of people around that table. And I think that there, you know, in many ways, this was an ideal that was never really reached in a group of people that never really sat around the table like this. But I think just the self-conception and the reality of how broad this coalition of millions of people that was transformed in the course of this struggle um, really is, is an interesting point and an important point because it talks about what's the most important question, right? Is like, I think for many of us, which is how do we really create um, the broad type of, of movement that can really win change. Um, so next slide, please. So I wanted to have this quote. This is a quote of, of Douglas on Lincoln. Um, I, I'll let people read it a, a bit here. And, and I wanna emphasize one piece towards the end. Um, you know, This is a speech that he gave at the inauguration of a statue in Washington DC um, in Lincoln Park, uh, the, the great emancipator statue of Lincoln. And of course that's kind of the piece that we get normally about sort of the union and the Republicans is this great emancipator concept of Abraham Lincoln, maybe a few other people, uh, people expand it down, but they were good hearted people who just did the right thing as it were, and you know, opened their hearts and the civil war ended. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that, but I think many of us have heard this narrative in some way, shape or form. So you can see here, what's interesting to me about Douglas's quote and what I think speaks to the relevance of how we understand coalition politics and social change is the contradictions that he puts here. Um, you know, he says in the first paragraph, Abraham Lincoln was not in the fullest sense of the word, either our man or our model in his interest in his associations in his habits of thought and in his prejudices, he was a white man. He was ready and willing at any time during the first years of his administration to deny, postpone, and sacrifice the rights of humanity in the colored people. That's a powerful statement, right? And it's certainly one that speaks against a lot of the mythology that we hear. But then the way he ends is interesting too, right? Um, no man who knew Abraham Lincoln could hate him, but because of his fidelity to union and liberty, he is doubly dear to us, black people, uh, and his memory will be precious forever. Doubly dear to us, his memory will be precious forever, except this was the person who was ready and willing at any time to deny, postpone, and sacrifice the rights of humanity in the colored people. So it feels like a little of a, a bit of a contradiction, right? But I think here's the key passage of what Douglas is saying. And I encourage people to read the whole speech. Uh, it's fantastic, but uh, be that as it may, he says here, uh, we, we were able to make a comprehensive view of Abraham Lincoln and to make reasonable allowance for the circumstances of his position. We came to the conclusion that the hour and the man of our redemption had somehow met in the person of Abraham Lincoln. And here's the key part. Abraham Lincoln was at the head of a great movement and was in living and earnest sympathy with that movement. And, and I think that's a really interesting key fact is that how Douglas and how, and he's speaking really of black people during the Civil War, how they viewed and related to Lincoln was not so much based on any view of it being perfect, any view of him even being that motivated by their own humanity, perhaps being motivated in their view by something totally different, the preservation of the union. But that Lincoln, as someone who is at the head of this movement that had as its main goal, uh, union or perish, whatever it took, someone who was willing to push the struggle as far as it took, it opened and set forward the stage by which the intervention of Black America could exploit the contradictions of the country at large and actually be victorious by shaping this coalition uh, through its own actions that the only way the war could really end was for it to be a war against slavery um, and for it to take on a whole new character, which it did, and which of course um, various actions by many people contributed. Um, next slide, please. please. Thank you. So I, I say that to say to introduce the question of, well, who were these people in the, this, this broad coalition, right? Um, and these are, I mean, I sort of shorthanded these. So, you know, any real historians in the class don't, uh, don't take me to task for this, but I wanted to give some general sense of, uh, of what it was. You know, I have the smallest 
subset, right? Strict unionist is what I called them. Basically the people who rallied to the Republican banner, you know, mainly after the war was already basically starting principally because they thought the union should not break up. There's many reasons for that. Many of them were formed the, the border states, which were slave states, but it's rooted in a politics of a couple decades before around the vitality and dynamism of America and what that could mean, quote unquote. So let's push that aside. Maybe the largest sort of bulk, a broad category of people I think could be grouped under something called free soilers. Um, I use that term because the free soil party was the largest individual party in the 18. 50s and a little bit before that, um, that became the kernel of the Republican Party. And the root ideology there was called sort of free soil. And I think you can probably guess what that's about, right? Um, people who did not want the lands in the Western part of the country that had been opened up through the genocide of Native Americans to homesteaders, many of whom were immigrants coming from Europe in the context of many social challenges and problems there, uh, and wanted to settle and wanted to believe, although this was never really the case, but wanted to believe the propaganda of people who were being sent into these, these uh, far reaches of Europe to bring people over, labor brokers, um, wanted to believe the idea that anyone could come to America, get a piece of land, work it, and become rich or something approximating it. And Lincoln, of course, you know, in many ways, this was his, his appeal because that was his trajectory. Um, that being said, the real opposition to slavery then was not necessarily even against slavery per se, but against the idea of slavery expanding outside of the South. And that was the whole conflict in the 1850s, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the Fugitive Slave Act, all these different things were all related to that idea. And that's why it was so contentious because there were many people who felt the expansion of slavery was the end of the quote unquote, uh, uh, you know, American idea of success and prosperity. That was never really true, but let's just put it there, people certainly were believing it and wanted to try to live it out and slavery was an obstacle in their way. There was also, and this was a decisive minority of people, the anti-slavery forces. Now the anti-slavery forces are obviously made up of abolitionists, but I say, you know, I, I also say that abolition minded here, if you read what I wrote there, and, and these are just short notes for people, you know, um, nothing comprehensive, but uh, I say abolition minded because the way we talk about this, certainly the vast majority of people were not abolitionist um, in the country writ large. But the way it's always talked about is well, abolition was like a narrow minority current, which is true and false because it's really in reference to the white population, not in reference to the fact that the, you know, I'm sure there were a few, I guess, who disagreed, but let's just say basically every single black person was an abolitionist. And so I think when we think about the social force of abolition, we shouldn't just think of a tiny little force of people. Um, in 1860, the vast majority of New England um, was dominated by abolitionist politicians. So I, I just want to say that as a side thing that sometimes, you know, we look in history and we're told movements are minorities and we're told that they're small, blah, 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 and we don't recognize the depth and the breadth of them. But in addition to abolitionists, you also have 48ers. And these were people who were coming from Germany after the revolution of 1848, Marx and Engels, very involved in that, um, many different types of politics, all the organized communists in America at that time were just about, happened to be 48ers. Many were not communists, they were just Democrats and they you know, came to America um, as refugees oftentimes, sometimes as immigrants, but believed um, that slavery in and of itself was, was a wrong just and should be eliminated and should be fought. So all of them, all of them were radical people, but they all were pretty strongly uh, and staunchly anti-slavery. And in fact, the whole reason Missouri did not go over to uh, the Confederacy is German 48er beer workers who were able to seize an armory and stop the Confederate forces from doing it. There were also people who were coming from something called the Know Nothing Party, um, which so not all of them were against slavery, but many of them were against slavery. Uh, it's probably not the right place to get into the Know Nothings, but very anti-immigrant force made up primarily of working class, Anglo-Saxon, if you will, white people in major Northeastern cities um, for their own reasons. Many of them were against slavery and some of them became uh, 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 members of the Republican party. So I say that to see that you can see it's a very diverse group of people with a very wide range of interest. Many of them, I think malign interests, quite frankly, many of them, uh, you know, certainly not fully committed to black humanity in any way, but they were really united uh, behind one basic issue, which is that Slavery A should not expand and then B as the war went on that slavery must end in order to defeat the Confederacy. So next slide here. 
so how could you have such a broad unity of people um which i think even as that that just points out the broad movement the great movement at douglas points it out and i think that there are a few things that one could say and i'll just try to summarize what i'm saying what's on the slide very quickly uh you know the main issue is that understanding what slavery really was slavery was a pre-capitalist institution right it was both a precondition for and a component part of uh, the capitalist system. So the what's known as primitive accumulation, right? The stealing of wealth, land, labor, destruction of so many peoples to build up capitalism, use slavery. And then as capitalism was developed, slavery was still a piece of it. But that being said, it was kind of a leftover piece of it. And so there was a lot of different elements of society that had their own reasons to be against slavery. Uh, you know, Black America, we can certainly understand that. You had the industrial ruling class, the industrial capitalists, the industrial bourgeoisie, if you will, that was growing by leaps and bounds just before the war and exploded during the war, huge supporters of the union because they viewed slavery as an obstacle to the full development of a capitalist economy where everyone's a worker and everything's a commodity so that they can make a huge amount of money. Um, you could think about uh, John Rockefeller, he got to start around now uh, with Standard Oil during the war, buying up refineries, armor and meat packing, railroads, many of the major institutions were all coming around, they supported the war. Like I said before, amongst 48ers, you have people who were communist, and you have people who would later become in American history some of the worst capitalist exploiters by the 1880s, right? So all these people were united around the idea that slavery in and of itself had some fundamental block to the life that they wanted to live. And that contradiction was exactly what allowed the movement of Black America en masse in the war to start to move all of society because their own struggle for freedom was directly in accordance with the struggle against what huge sections of the country felt was an inability to live their life in a positive way. Now it's very complex and our next class is about reconstruction, which will explain how a lot of those complexities started to break down and you know, many of those antecedents are why we are where we are now. But I think it's important to recognize that as Douglas noted, right, that the issue wasn't so much um, the, the purity of the individuals who were involved, but the fact that there was a coalition that was assembled of people who all had one thing in common, which was that the Confederate ruling class was their enemy and that they could work on that in a way to transform society. And because slavery was so crucial to capitalism, um, you know, any challenge to slavery became a broader challenge to many other things and opened up new possibilities. So I think that's just an important reality about how this took place, that it's not necessarily just an issue of moral goodness or moral rightness, but strategic reality and the intelligence of Black America's political representatives in the South and in the North to really grasp and to understand these complexities, to engage with the Republican Party, to play on those complexities and to transform the Civil War into a revolutionary war. So um, next slide. So these are just a few things I wanted to show here, go through them quickly. It's an ad on the left side there for the Liberty Party. Why support the Liberty Party? Because the slave system can be effectually reached by political power. Um, that's an important issue. There are many abolitionists at the time this came out that didn't believe that you should vote. They just thought that the only way to end slavery was a, a radical, um, biblical, really, um, revolutionary style struggle. That's certainly the type of... Uh, 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 thing they were building on. The second one here on the right the part is a flyer for the Free Soil Party um, that was in Boston that was happening in the 1850s. Next slide. And I just wanted to end with this slide here. And, uh, you know, this is a recruiting poster for the United States colored troops there in Philadelphia. And the next slide here that I also want to just end in sort of a transitional way. This was projected onto the Robert E. Lee statue um, on Friday night in Richmond, Virginia. I thought that was a powerful piece. Uh, and I think it speaks to where I wanna go and where I wanna bridge to Joe's presentation, which is really the role of black America um, in an interventionist way in the civil war. So thank you um, comrades, friends for, for listening. And now I will hand it off to Joe. Dope. Uh, thank you so, mu so much, uh, Angel and Eugene, for that context and those presentations. Like Eugene said, my name is Joe. I'm an organize organizer with the PSL out here in Boston. Really happy to be here with you all, but I'm just going to get right into it because uh, there's a lot to cover. So uh, 
building off of that context that both Angela and Eugene provided, I want to start off by examining the Union's original stated intentions in the Civil War and then cover how it became a war to end chattel slavery. Because I think looking at it in this way will really clarify the significant role that Black people played in this entire process. Uh, at the onset of the war, Lincoln and the moderate Republicans, as well as their military officials, were clear that they had no intentions of ending chattel slavery. In fact, they went to great lengths to prove their allegiance to the country's so-called uh, peculiar institution. One Union general promised to put down any slave insurrection with an iron hand, while others went out of their way to send back fugitive slaves who sought refuge behind Union lines. Uh, next slide, please. In hindsight, though, this appears at first glance to be a, a huge strategic blunder by the Union. The Confederacy's greatest weakness was that its entire economy, its ability to feed its population and its army, its ability to equip itself for war, all of it was driven by four million enslaved Black people who had every reason to want to see the Confederacy fall. But rather than capitalizing on this weakness, the Union government went out of their way to prove to Black Southerners that they had no allies or interest in this war. And just the chart that's on the slide there shows the immense growth of cotton production, which of course was underpinned by slavery uh, over the course of the, the 19th century in the United States, just to again show the centrality of uh, slavery to the Southern economy. So this seemingly puzzling decision does make sense though if we really examine the Union's motivations in this war. We often hear that the Civil War was a war to preserve the Union, but we should examine what that means. Why was it so important to preserve the Union? And we know that the US government likes to whip up symbolic patriotic ideals as propaganda for many of its efforts, all of the wars that uh, we've been in for my entire lifetime, but this isn't ever really the motivation behind, this, behind its actions, and that's what uh, we need to explore. So next slide, please. Uh, this is a quote from W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. I'm just going to uh, read the bolded section for sake of time, but you know, feel free to try to speed read the rest. It says, the tremendous economic ideal of keeping this great market for goods, the United States, together with all its possibilities of agriculture, manufacture, trade, and profit, appealed to both the West and the North, and then what was, and what was then much more significant, it appealed to the border states. Uh, next slide, please. So of course, I think as Eugene did a great job of covering, this was an incredibly complex situation with many different social forces, but first and foremost for the Northern government, preserving the union meant preserving the capitalist ability to maximize their profits. To embrace and recruit black Americans was the union's surest path to win the war, but doing so would jeopardize the economic position of capital. And we actually see a similar phenomenon today with today's uh, Democratic Party, which could easily dominate elections with a popular working class program, but the party is unwilling to adopt such a program because it's fundamentally loyal to and accountable to the US capitalist class, even though it's trying to manage a much broader and uh, much more diverse coalition. But both the Union and the Confederacy, uh, I think, made a significant miscalculation here. Uh, I think the arrogance and racism of both North and South led them to view Black Americans as objects to be acted upon and directed by the white elite, if, if not outright ignored. But as we've learned today from Angel's presentation, that has never been the case uh, in the US history. And it certainly wasn't the case during uh, an event as momentous as the Civil War. So despite the Union's hostility and racism, many slaves took matters into their own hands and fled the plantations at the onset of the Civil War in 1861, which was well before the Emancipation Proclamation was even a consideration. Just to give one example here, uh, it's pictured on this slide as well. Uh, in 1861, there was the creation of the Freedom Fort, uh, what became known as the Freedom Fort in Virginia. Initially, three fugitive slaves turned up to Fort Monroe in Virginia and the Union General there declared them contraband of war and put them to work at the fort. Word then spread that slaves who arrived at this so-called Freedom Fort would not be returned to the plantations and eventually thousands of enslaved people fled to Fort Monroe. The rumor at the time was that black people found the fortress through uh, by means of a mysterious spiritual telegraph 
But in reality, I think the rapid growth of the Freedom Fort is indicative of the level of organization and tenacity among enslaved people that Angel spoke to earlier. Some people, uh, leaders in the Union, like General Butler, who was in charge of Fort Monroe, and Simon Cameron, who was the Secretary of War at the time, were in favor of the Union capitalizing on enslaved people's inevitable resistance by employing uh, escaped slaves as laborers, like at Fort Monroe, or even as soldiers. But initially, these positions were repudiated by the uh, Lincoln administration. Next slide, please. However, uh, you know, despite as the Union began, began to understand the strategic position of slaves in the war and that the war was not going to end as quickly as they may have initially thought, uh, they gradually shifted their orientation uh, towards the question of slavery. Only eight months after the start of the war, the Union adopted the position in a formal report that slaves held by Confederate rebels could be, quote, justly liberated from their constraint and made more valuable in various employments through voluntary and compensated service than if confiscated as subjects of property, end quote. So this was not emancipation by any means, but it was a signal to enslaved Black people that their interests aligned more with the Union than with the Confederacy. And according to W.E.B. Du Bois, who's uh, pictured on the slide and you know, wrote the fantastic book, Black Reconstruction, this pivot by the Union catalyzed a general strike against the slave system on the part of all who could find an opportunity. The trickling streams of fugitives swelled to a flood. This was not merely the desire to stop work. It was a strike on a wide basis against the conditions of work. It was a general strike that involved directly in the end, perhaps half a million people. Next slide, please. But despite the exodus of slaves from the plantations by 1863, the Union was still not in position to win the war for a few reasons. First being that at least three and a half million enslaved people still remained on Confederate plantations. Secondly, uh, white workers in the North were rebelling against the draft and many were refusing to fight in a war that they didn't think benefited their interests. And thirdly, countries in Europe, most notably England and France, were on the verge of recognizing the Confederacy as a separate nation due to their capitalist industry's heavy reliance on Southern cotton as a key raw material for manufacturing. Under these circumstances, Lincoln announced the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, which declared all slaves in Confederate states thenceforward and forever free. And here pictured on the slide, you can read the Union's motivation for emancipation in its own words. And I am going to read this full quote because I think it's illuminating. Uh, you know full well, for you have been all over this country, that the rebels have sent into the fields all their available fighting men, every man capable of bearing arms. And you know they have kept at home all their slaves for the raising of subsistence for their armies in the field. In this way, they can bring to bear against us all the strength of their so-called Confederate states, while we at the North can only send a portion of our fighting force, being compelled to leave behind another portion to cultivate our fields and supply the wants of an immense army. The administration has determined to take from the rebels this source of supply, to take their Negroes and compel them to send back a portion of their whites to cultivate their deserted plantations, and very poor persons they would be to fill the place of dark-hued labor. They must do this or their armies will starve. And uh, that's from Lorenzo Thomas, who was an adjutant general of the Union Army, speaking to other uh, army officers of, from the Union in Louisiana. Uh, next slide, please. I do have to say, though, that in reality, the Union could only take enslaved people from areas of the Confederacy that they had already conquered and occupied. And this wasn't the case for the majority of uh, slaves who were still living in the Confederacy. So despite its bold rhetoric, in reality, the Emancipation Proclamation only provided legal sanction to the hundreds of thousands of slaves who had already freed themselves or been freed by the Union Army. And it also encouraged other slaves to flee and join the Union Army. In other words, Black people would need to continue taking action for the Emancipation Proclamation to have real teeth. And you might guess by uh, the name of this slide and the name of the section, uh, black people did just that. Four and a half million Black Americans, both free and enslaved, were galvanized by the Emancipation Proclamation, and it converted the Civil War into a moral crusade, into a war to end chattel slavery. And this really rearranged 
the battle of forces in the United States. Abolitionists really became prominent leaders in the country, and this was a dynamic that helped lay the groundwork for the uh, post-war radical reconstruction period we'll touch on later in this series. Black people also clamored to serve in the war. Uh, prior to the Emancipation Proclamation, several Union generals had created Black regiments out of desperation and actually had found thousands of willing Black volunteers, uh, but these generals were reprimanded and disciplined in, for these actions. It wasn't until January 1863, just five days after the Declaration of the Emancipation Proclamation, that the Secretary of War authorized the creation of Black Army regiments. And then Black people rushed to join the war. Just that month, uh, New York received permission to assemble a Black regiment, and within two weeks, over 1,000 Black people had volunteered to serve. Large regiments were also raised in Massachusetts, including the famous uh, 54th Massachusetts Regiment that's featured in Glory, as well as Pennsylvania and uh, other states as well. Uh, next slide, please. Black people then quickly proved their mettle in battle as courageous and effective fighters. They were frequently deployed as shock troops who are shoulder, soldiers who are trained to lead an attack and are often expected to take heavy casualties. So a very high risk position, uh, but really essential to the you know, uh, success of a campaign. And black soldiers played a key role in many battles. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm only gonna mention the Vicksburg campaign here which was a, an effort by the Union to seize control of the Mississippi River from the Confederates in 1863. Uh, the river, as you can imagine, was a really crucial asset for communication and transportation, and it was thus the key to the Confederates' war effort. Black troops played a critical role in the Union victories in the siege of Port Hudson, and as the, the Battle of Milliken's Bend, and the Vicksburg campaign was ultimately successful uh, in large part due to the uh, contribution and the sacrifice of Black soldiers. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I think it's also important to note that seeing the bravery and skill of Black soldiers in battle ruptured the white supremacist myths that portrayed Black people as docile, meek, dumb, what have you, and it transformed the consciousness of many white soldiers and civilians. The shift was also reflected in popular media I want to highlight one example from the New York Times, the underlined section, uh, which said that official testimony from the siege of Port Hudson, quote, settles a question that the Negro race can fight with great prowess. It is not longer possible to doubt the bravery and steadiness of the colored race. And you can find many similar kind of testimonies from soldiers who fought alongside black fighters, as well as reporters who uh, were on the ground. Uh, next slide, please. I think it hopefully it goes without saying that you know no oppressed people should even have to prove their humanity and worth to anyone, but the growth of white consciousness during the Civil War illustrates that racist attitudes are eradicable and that consciousness is most malleable, most subject to change during intense periods of struggle when the true nature of class society is most clearly revealed. I mean, we saw this historical truth also play out during the uh, movement against racism during this past summer when tens of millions of people, many of whom had never protested before and many of whom were not black, united under black leadership and the slogans of jail killer cops, defund the police and abolish the police, gaining invaluable insight into the nature of policing under white supremacy and capitalism throughout that process. And I do wanna note that this is why we in the PSL are committed both to staying on the front lines of class struggle in the US and also to the process of building a multinational working class movement through that process. Uh, next slide, please. During the Civil War, the uh, potential and power of such multinational solidarity manifested not only domestically, but internationally as well. I mentioned earlier that before the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, both England and France were on the verge of recognizing the Confederacy as an independent state. And this strategy was of course driven by the capitalists of these countries, but the English and French workers who had suffered greatly during the war could have easily supported such a strategy as well. But I wanna quote uh, a bit extensively from Du Bois here uh, about the struggle in England, uh, where he said, the war had created a great scarcity of cotton. The factories closed and more than half the looms and spindles lay idle. 
Notwithstanding this, the English workers stood up for the abolition of Negro slavery and protested against the intervention of the English. As soon as Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, the working men of England held hundreds of meetings all over the country and in all industrial sections and hailed his actions. The reaction in England to the Emancipation Proclamation was too enthusiastic for the government to dare take any radical step, end quote. Um, I think that's just an incredible quote because it shows that the strength and fervor of the English working class movement deprived the Confederacy of a powerful potential ally. And this was a pivotal development that I think is indica indicative of the role of international solidarity in working class and national liberation movements. But with all that being said, ultimately the war had to be won on the home front and without the intervention of hundreds of thousands of black people, the union would not have won the civil war. And if that sounds uh, like an exaggeration and we can take Abraham Lincoln's own words uh, to, to illustrate that fact, if you could go to the next slide, please. Again, just to read the bolded section here, uh, Lincoln said, abandon all the posts now garrisoned by black men, take 200,000 men from our side and put them in the battlefield or cornfield against us, and we would be compelled to abandon the war in three weeks. That's uh, from a statement that Abraham Lincoln made in 1864, uh, which was the year before the war even ended. So even by that time, the uh, indispensable role of Black people in, in that struggle was made clear. Uh, next slide, please. So just to wrap up, uh, if, to give a sense of the, the magnitude of Black participation in the war, uh, by the end of the war, roughly 179,000 Black men served as soldiers in the U.S. Army, and another 19,000 served in the Navy. Black troops took part in at least 198 battles for the Union, and Black women who could not formally join the Army nonetheless served as nurses, spies, and scouts, the most famous of whom being Harriet Tubman, who scouted for the second South Carolina Volunteers. Including soldiers, servants, laborers, and spies, between 300,000 and 400,000 Black people served in the Union Army. Uh, next slide, please. So I think this all goes to show that the Black masses in the tradition of Nat Turner, the Stono Rebellion, the New York Slave Revolts, the Black masses were the real great emancipators. In the words of Du Bois, the Black worker won the war by a general strike which transferred his labor from the Confederate planter to the Northern invader. The Confederacy, uh, as many of us know, surrendered in April 1865 and having witnessed Black Americans wield their collective power in an unprecedented manner, the entire country entered the Reconstruction period with a new understanding. Black people were not docile objects or property, but a social force that will play a central role in determining the new political and economic reality of the country. Uh, but that is a topic for another class. So I'm going to wrap up there and pass it back to Eugene, and we're going to transition into some discussion.